The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, Chapter 5, Escape and the Return of the Victor. When someone dreams, they never remain rooted to the spot. They move almost at will away from the place or the state in which they find themselves. Around the 13th year, the fellow traveling ego is discovered. That is the reason why dreams of a better life grow so luxuriantly around this time. They stir the fermenting day, fly beyond school and home, take with them what is good for and dear to us. Our outriders of our escape and establish the first quarters for our clarifying wishes. We practice the art of talking about what we have not yet experienced. Even an average mind tells itself stories at this time, simple fables in which things go better. It spins out the stories on the way home from school or when walking with friends, and the narrator is always in the middle as an opposed picture. Almost everyone is filled with a hatred for the average at this time, even if they have not strayed too far from the nest themselves. The silly young goose wants to improve herself. The young lout sneers at his stuffy home. Girls play around with their first name just like they do with their hairstyles. They make it more piquant than it is and in doing so they reach the beginning of a dreamed existence that is different. Young boys aspire to a nobler life than their father might lead to tremendous deeds. They try their luck, it tastes forbidden and makes everything new. Putting to sea. Sexual attraction is not always part of this process, at least not in an obvious way. Girls retain an acquired shyness for a long time. Boys pride themselves on a certain dry coolness. This is obviously quite old. Often arrogance and self-love prevent them from giving love a special place in their dreams. The right boy or the right girl do not seem to be around or only among their own sex. Often they are not even present in wishing. Thus, the castle in the air seldom becomes a castle of pleasure at this stage. The harem and the dream woman only come later. Infantile structures are also preserved for quite a long time in this dry fantasy. The theme of escape fulfills their loneliness. A woman relates of this time, I want to become a painter. I dreamed myself into an oriental castle on a mountain, living alone there with my illegitimate child, which I had had by a very distinguished man. A man asked about his fantasies at 15 related the following. I wanted to go to sea and imagined a unique battleship. It was called the Argo, did so many knots per hour that it was present on all the coasts of the earth almost simultaneously. I was master of the Argo with the title and rank of Prince Admiral, Admiral, ruled over all emperors and kings, redrew the map of the world with the help of the electric cannons, reestablished my beloved Turkey, once more within her old borders. Oh. Once a year came the night of flight, the ship left the water, landed on the highest mountain on earth. There I entertained my friends, let them see into the future through a specially placed window, worked the mysterious green ray. This ray shines shortly after sunset on the Pacific Ocean, and I knew how to operate it so that we could see all the lost empires of the past. These are still excessive bourgeois notions of a juvenile kind. In proletarian adolescents of this age, they are much more muted, more grown up even, and more realistic. But even if here the contents of ce- have ceased to be so fantastic, their attraction still remains like that of a fairy tale, sharply transcending the given world. Clearly, such fantasies uh, do not only emanate from the depths of the mind, but just as often from newspapers, from adventure books, with their wonderfully glossy pictures, from booths at the fair where chains rattle and are broken, where the song to the evening stars sung and the half moon shines. Argo, Turkey, and the like come from there, even the raw or rough color of adventure with which these figments glow. The elemental ship image characterizes the will to depart, the dream of itinerant revenge and exotic victory. Argo and the equivalent images that almost every individual can replace this with their own experience, uh, 
explain this with from their own experience, is a kind of arc for the principal wishes of this time, for the trumping wishes. The will destroys the house in which it is bored, and in which the best things are forbidden. So in timeless history, it builds its mountain stronghold in the clouds, or the knight's castle in the form of a ship. The glittering bowl. Only then do pleasures which have grown sweet announce themselves, foam immediately. Love lets no one alone into the dreamed castle or out on the, on the sea. Loneliness is no longer sought after and spun out in fantasies, but is intolerable. It is the most intolerable aspect of the life that begins at 17. So if the right girl eludes us for too long, the girl whom we think up, think out, appears anywhere. The torment of having missed out then becomes monstrous. Every party which we did not go to leaves space for us to picture wishful images, and the young adolescent believes that one of these descended to earth on the very evening he missed. Uh, I lost my fucking spot. Now it is too late to meet her, because the girl, even if she were to be found, would be no match for the brilliance of the image he has painted. But erotic enchantment plays a part even in felicitous encounters. It clothes the girl in its dream. The street or the town in which the loved one lives turns to gold, turns into a party. The name of the loved one shines upon the stones, slates and railings. Her house always lies beneath invisible palm trees. We are unsure of our own powers because there are too many of them and they disturb each other. So the young man is mostly pulled to and fro between extreme dejection, to the point of asking himself if he even deserves to be in the world at all, and compensating arrogance. Embarrassment and impudence are bound up together here. The adolescent who is not part of the average world or who hates it feels he is a little, a little god, and since the others do not take the trouble to prove his existence, he does it himself. He wants to be the first to reach the goal, wants to outdo the others. The goal can be a completely external one. It stands for an unknown goal. What smooth skin or the good fortune to have long legs or hard muscles meant to children becomes a young girl's pride in so-called gentleman friends. A young boy is the vanity of being seen with the prettiest girl in town or in the area. Feelings of uncertainty of being unsure of oneself go deeper while being spurned has never felt so bitterly, being chosen, room at the top, never so rapturously as in puberty. Youth itself becomes a scourge or a laurel here. There is no middle ground. Beyond loneliness, which is so strenuously avoided, there is only defeat, which refutes claims to validity, claims to the future, or victory, which proves them. Immaturity, per se, is an invitation to go one better. This is not empty as in later years, but rather vex vexatious, taunting to itself. Thus, everything wavers and wishes to be placed, to be fixed, especially the life light, the future image of the life which youth expects. All we know for certain is that it should not contain any trivialities, and that no other season except spring should count in it. The young person torments himself with the enjoyable prospect of this future. He wants to induce it all at once, even with storms, suffering, thunder, and lightning, as long as it is just life, real life, that has so far not yet come, or yet become. And the world begins with our own youth. Nothing is stranger for an adolescent than to imagine the courtship of his parents, and nothing more awkward than imagining himself in age, with children now themselves having his own courtship and his own, apparently unsurpassable, spring. During this period of youth, it also becomes apparent that the only thing that actually binds us and establishes friendship is the common expectation of a common future. This unites us as matter-of-factly as working together does in later years. If the common future falls away, then the living spirit of the youthful friendship, if that is all it was, disappears. This explains why nothing is flatter and more forced than seeing old school friends again after many years. They have become like the teachers, like the grown-ups of the past, like everything against which we had conspired. Such reunions make it seem as if the youthful faces and dreams have not only disappeared as is obvious, 
but as if they have been betrayed. But this enormous shock does make us realize how much headiness and rootly oath how much mountain air swirled and still swirls above real 17-year-olds. But this mountain air, too, is full of squalls. It is swept up in the changing winds, racing here and there in the most uncertain of all ages of life. Uncertain even intellectually, since only very few young people enjoy one of, the most, one of those inescapable talents which make a job into a vocation, and so spare us the choice. So many young girls, of course, wish to go into films. Almost every young man has great ideas which cannot be sold in the normal job market. However, these are more general wishes and directions. Fortunately, they are not pursued for long. They lack the detail of talent. In fact, even where there is the urge, more common these days, towards productive expression, towards painting, music, or writing, it comes as a surprise that everything shrinks in the execution. Adolescents of this kind know the feeling of a fire burning inside them, of art being so close. But when they try to grasp its being, it becomes dry. It shrinks so much that they cannot even fill a page. Talking at this time is common and easy, writing hard. And if it is produced, the fruit appears precisely to the overflowing writer himself like a shriveled plum, black and wizened. Bettina von Arnim, who says this, and who all her life could not get beyond this adolescent feeling, thus mostly chose letters to express herself. Another form is the diary, which, not without reason, is called secret, or is imparted secretly. Many an adult uses jottings like these, if he has made them, and if he has kept them with faithful vanity, as a gauge to measure how low his water level has sunk. Love, melancholy, embryonic images, and thought masks. Everything is fished for here and remains in its initial stages. But the life light, containing nothing stale, shines vexatiously, tauntingly to itself. So this time seems to be unhappy and blissful at the same time. The feeling of spring later contains both. But the desire for courage, for color, breadth, height, it is general. The real adolescent develops from a will, which in these years is always still a chivalric will. Hence the dream of adventures which are to be undergone, of beauty begging to be discovered, of greatness begging to be won. Because our own life still lies a long way ahead, all distance is made more beautiful. The wish not only impels us towards the distance, but now it propels itself into it without a hiding place, all the more strongly the narrower our situation. Even the distance with the evening express or sorry, even the distance which the evening express train brings into the smallest town can suffice as a symbol, the distance of the capital, seen from the provinces. In this way a dissolutely daring, carelessly beautiful, wishful image develops without relatives miles away from them. Inside is the expanded soul in which longing is at work outside the dreamed image of a city which could fulfill it. One of the strongest wishes in human nature, and one which is most frequently violated, is the wish to be important, and this is further combined especially strongly with the wish for a significant environment. Gifted girls wish to run away there. Munich had this attraction around 1900, Paris for much longer. Thrilled, the student enters the big city, Besides the bright lights, it is populated with sheer impatient hopes. Here, he believes he has at last found the ground and background for an existence which finally suits him. The houses, the squares, the stages seem bathed in a utopian light. In the cafe, at a proud little table, the chosen few are gathered who write verses. Heavenly strings await the boy who plays the double ba bass. Fame taps at the window. It is not surprising that with the wishful image of triumph, that of trumping also returns or is included in the erotic sheen. If the parent's home was not only narrow but also bad, then the pictured homecoming of the victor is a particularly popular and widespread dream. A form of satisfaction so overwhelming that it welcomes the previous misery almost at a foil, as a foil. The famous actress goes back, her parents and neighbors stand timidly aside, Graciously, she forgives what they did to her. 
The downtrodden boy of days gone by comes back in a coach and four. By his side, the beautiful rich girl whom he has captured as his wife. He is now no longer misunderstood, returning as a general or as a great artist, returning at least with a magnificence that puts them to shame. His is the princess, graceful, proud, and gentle, with the perfume of high above, and around her swirls the silver travel veil. All this is the splendor their darling has won. All this is like nice through home. Or, nice, sorry. All this is like nice brought, or nice brought home. These are particularly immature, wishful dreams, but they are still to be found today in the Western glossy image of these years. Desirous, aware, mindful, possessed, in control, full. These words govern the genitive and the wishes of bourgeois youth. The often invoked streak of blue in the bourgeois sky became, of course, a streak of blood. The stupid or stupefied had their very own strongman called Hitler. But the greatness of a young mediocrity has never shown without capricious figures. The wish itself puts them on his arm. At this time between the March and June of life, there is no break. Either love fills it up or the prospect of a kind of stormy or the prospect of a kind of stormy dignity.